Welcome back. Fighting fear with facts. It's what we're attempting to do every night during this pandemic around this time. Tonight, we're joined by Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who did his, his briefing now every day, and I appreciate him every Wednesday coming on and answering some of your questions. Mayor, thank you for joining us tonight. First question, Thanks, Mr. first question, is faster testing on the way? And I would even go farther than that. Are you frustrated at all with the amount of testing you're seeing, and particularly with how long it's taking yeah. to get the results back? Um, so let me answer, answer the first part first. Uh, faster testing is on the way. Unfortunately, there is still a federal approval process, FDA approval, that has to be um, cleared. And then, of course, there is just a, a relative uh, bottleneck with the amount of testing that's needed to get out in the communities. And right now we've seen the federal government, FEMA in particular, purchase all of the available rapid testing that has created a backlog in all the communities waiting for them. Uh, so to answer the second question, yeah, it has been frustrating. Um, uh, clearly, the United States was not prepared in terms of the available testing capacity. That's been documented and, and debated for a long time now. But every community in the country faced with um, pending um, community-wide infections is working to get those tests. Uh, they're, they're coming finally. Um, we're actually seeing a couple of private providers now that are, are starting to vet, uh, uh, validate the test, the faster tests. We're actually seeing in our uh, pre-approved lab at Freeman Coliseum, they're able to get those test results turned around in 24, sometimes 48 hours through a local lab. So things are getting a lot faster now. Good. Next question. How can we get a true number of who is infected if testing is hard to obtain both financially and medically for people with no insurance? Well, that's a great question. So uh, testing is really ultimately the only way we can determine the actual level of infection. Uh, everything else is extrapolated data from the testing that we have available. Uh, right now we have 554 uh, positive tests or positive infections in our community. Uh, we do know that we're in a period of community spread, so the stay home order um, is, in a sense, coming from the public health authorities' guidance that says we have to treat everyone we encounter as if they have the infection. We know the infection is much more widespread uh, in this country than what the current testing shows because simply the testing has not been wide enough in any community. We're working in every, in every part of this country to get it. Uh, a much wider assessment, get more tests online as quickly as possible, but we do have to assume it's wider than what the data shows. Yeah, next question. Mayor Nuremberg with numbers going up. Have you thought about shutting down grocery stores and allowing them to only offer curbside service? So the stay home order uh, falls in line with uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the governor's order, uh, which is quite similar to what we've had in San Antonio and other um, uh, urban population centers in Texas. Unfortunately, uh, we are limited in further restrictions based on the state order. We cannot go more restrictive than the state in terms of what is deemed an essential activity. Uh, I will say this, um, you know, there are certain essential activities that keep, uh, you know, households running, food security, uh, food um, supply is one of them. But the grocery stores in this city um, and in Texas, uh, particularly HEB, have been very proactive in implementing social distancing guidelines. It's unfortunately very difficult to regulate, but we're seeing uh, much more proactive um, you know, work being done in those essential businesses to make sure that people are staying six feet apart and that there's no spread. It's also one of the reasons why we're guiding people to wear cloth masks when they're out in public. Is there a number or email to report an assisted living facility for not being compliant with the city's emergency orders? And of course, this has to do with the fact that we've seen 10 people who died on the southeast from that nursing home facility. Is there a yes, number to call so, if people want to report something? Yeah, so um, nursing facilities, long-term care facilities are actually state regulated, but we can filter any uh, violations of our order, stay home order, or get them to the right place uh, simply by calling 210-207-SAPD. Any violations of that order, uh, we have to take very seriously because ultimately we're trying to prevent the spread of the disease. Next question also has to do with uh, nursing homes or assisted living facilities. Who takes care of residents in nursing homes or assisted living facilities if staff members become infected and have to self-quarantine? 
no long-term caretakers are allowed to work at more than one facility at a time. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and you know, these are very difficult conditions. And, and a lot of the um, residents in nursing home facilities have a lot of underlying conditions. They're older. Um, and so the, it's, a, a, it's a population that we have to be very careful with uh, and care for. Uh, so the nurses and technicians and workers in nursing home facilities are on the front lines of this battle, which is why we're trying to equip them with the proper PPE and uh, protocols to keep themselves and their communities safe. Uh, and they do some very, very difficult work, and most of them are, are doing a very good job of it. Unfortunately, they do become vectors of infection if, if there is uh, a virus introduced, and that's why we put the order in, which is similar to the CDC guidance, to make sure that um, they're only working in one location so it doesn't spread inadvertently to other locations. Um, but they're, they're, they're the front line, and the management companies have to ensure that their workers are treated well and that there is a supply of workers in the event that somebody goes downhill because we want to make sure that no worker um, is forced to work if they're not feeling well, if they're symptomatic, whether or not they have a positive um, infection or not. Next question uh, has to do with the homeless population. We had Kenny Wilson, the CEO from Haven for Hope on on Monday night. What and, and I, he kind of answered this first question, what are the homeless numbers on the coronavirus? He said he didn't know of any that had tested positive, uh, but uh, so I kind of answered this question, but what is the plan if somebody that's homeless does test positive to kind of keep them, you know, quarantined? Uh, a couple things. One, if there is a positive, we want to get that person isolated into shelter uh, so that they're not uh, infecting others as quickly as possible. And so we've had for several weeks now a facility under contract where we can do that. Thankfully, we haven't had to use that isolation facility. In addition to that, though, we know the shelter environment, um, if it's not well managed, um, generally is, is kind of a crowded location. So we've been working with Haven for Hope and other shelters to provide for a relief facility so that we can create a little bit more space in the shelters and make sure that we get especially the vulnerable members of our homo homeless population, you know, a little bit older, immune compromised into a place where they can be, uh, you know, be more be better cared for that's happened literally around the clock for the last week we've been working on those types of facilities we've got something in place now and so i think that the homeless shelters are in much better stronger position to ensure that they're not vectors for infection before you go i want to talk to you a little bit about the furloughs that were announced today again yeah. not not you know firings not some people being laid off their furloughs uh it has yeah. to do with the hotel occupancy tax and the fact that the hotels just aren't full right now yeah, well, the visitor industry, travel and tourism has really been devastated uh, over the last two months, not just here in San Antonio, throughout the country. Uh, when the planes stop flying and people stop visiting locations, they're staying at home, it, it, it really impacts travel and tourism. And, so, and certainly uh, that's our hotel and occupancy tax, which unfortunately funds in a dedicated manner some uh, particular city operations like convention and visitors. So that's been difficult to work through. Um, fortunately, we have very forward-looking management we have for the last you know, 10, 15 years in this city. Uh, and so we've afforded ourselves um, uh, you know, ability to care for our employees who we wanna keep part of this organization, uh, but are, are now able to furlough. So they are able to get some of the federal benefits associated with furlough and unemployment, but stay part of the city, continue to get the city health care and benefits uh, and stay part of the organization. So as soon as the visitor traffic starts to pick up again, we can get back up and running very quickly. Um, so, you know, this is tough. Every organization is, is going through this. We want to make sure that our approach is people first. I know when I hear hotel occupancy tax, you know, I know it goes to so many different things. But one of the yeah. main things it goes to is arts and culture in our city. Yeah. So what does it mean for some of the programs out there that are city funded or partially city funded uh, that were, that, you know, Luminaria and some of the other things? You know, so th this is uh, ongoing work with the city organization, with city management. Um, and, and, you know, so what, what we know is this, there's gonna be some belt tightening. Um, there is also going to be a lot of work with our state and federal government to pull down relief funds to fill the gap. I will say this, our city's identity is built on its arts and cultural community. It's gonna be very difficult for some time uh, to weather this uh, storm 
fiscal fiscal storm, but we're going to get through it. And I am guided by the the old adage uh, in wartime when you know arts organizations were were being decimated and and um, you know and someone said you know with the arts being cut then uh, what are we fighting for? Uh, our arts are part of our life, our soul, our heritage. We have to protect them. Uh, it is going to be uh, challenging several months, but we're going to work uh, with everyone in the arts community to make sure that we get through it together and we get everybody back on their feet as quickly as possible because that is our city, um, our character, our soul. And we want to make sure our arts community thrives when this is all over. Yeah, this is not a permanent thing. Uh, no, no. Um, we need to we need to get through this, obviously, uh, but then we need to get back to uh, seeing uh, the arts and culture continue to lead this city uh, in, into you know this century and being one of the great cities of the world. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, thank you for your time. Every Wednesday, I really appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks a lot, Steve. All right, take care. We'll be right back. You too.